Hello, I'm Monica Reinagel. Welcome to the Nutrition Diva podcast. Joining me on the show today is registered dietitian nutritionist Leslie Schilling. She's here to talk about her new book, Born to Eat, and a little bit about the growing popularity of the baby-led weaning movement. You may have heard something about this. It's, it's a new approach. Well, really, it's a return to a more traditional approach to feeding infants and young children. But this conversation does have some implications for the rest of us as well. I get an awful lot of questions from listeners about how to manage the introduction of solid foods for infants and toddlers. Parents and grandparents are understandably anxious about getting this right. And there's some conflicting information out there, not to mention a ton of lore and well-meaning advice that can get kind of overwhelming. Baby nutrition is sort of a specialty area of nutrition. And to be perfectly honest, it's not an area of particular expertise for me. But my colleagues, Leslie Schilling and Wendy Jo Peterson, both of whom are registered dietitian nutritionists, as well as mothers, have just written a new book called Born to Eat. Not only is this a fantastic resource for anybody who's navigating through this important phase of a child's and a family's life, but I love the relaxed and realistic approach that they take here. It's a much needed antidote to all of the dogma and stress that can accompany this topic. So I can highly recommend this book to you. And today, Leslie is joining me on the podcast to answer your most frequently asked questions about early nutrition and in particular, baby led weaning. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you so much for having me. So for those who aren't familiar with the baby led weaning movement, can you just briefly describe what that is and how it differs from the way we've been doing it for the last 50 years or so? It, it's it's funny because you mentioned that it's it's not really new. Um, baby led weaning is letting baby self feed the foods of the family, and and what we do is we make those textures and shapes just a little bit more appropriate for them. For example, if they had a slice of steak or avocado or things like that, we would just make it where they could hold it and manipulate it. And once babies are developmentally appropriate, they're able to really self-feed, which grab or grasp their foods um, and and start to use those innate skills that they already have. It's very um, <laughs> counter culture at the moment because we're so used to using traditional purees and babies being spoon fed. So I think it does scare people a little bit, but there's really nothing new about it. And it's funny that we call purees traditional because they've actually been used less than whole foods. Well, and I know that a lot of my readers are tying themselves in knots, trying to make all their own homemade pureed baby foods. And, and that's, you know, like a whole other level of mm -hmm. effort that may really just not be necessary. Absolutely. And, and if people want to do that, I mean, there's nothing wrong with using some purees because it's a texture that baby needs to know how to navigate, but it may not be necessary. Hmm. So baby led weaning is more than just a trendy new philosophy. There's some emerging research to support this approach as well. But I'm sure you've noticed as well, sometimes it can take a while for those clinicians on the front lines to catch up with new research. So I'm wondering whether parents ever face pushback from their pediatricians when they suggest that this is what they want to do. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, I have a particular client who, um, with her first child, she ended up not doing baby led weaning, even though she was super gung ho about it because her pediatrician was not supportive. And she, it was, she was not supportive because she didn't know about it. Hmm. Um, so she now has a different pediatrician, but it's very possible that, you know, healthcare providers just haven't heard of it. And it, that, that doesn't make it um, a non-viable resource or method. And there's a lot of positive research about using it um, right now. And it actually, the American Academy of Pediatrics, their health initiatives, which anybody can find on their website, per, actually promotes a self-feeding approach. And sometimes dietitians and parents and physicians don't even realize that. So we, sometimes we can use that lingo, um, self-feeding, 
and baby led weaning a little bit interchangeably if if that helps people kind of understand what you're doing. Yeah, self feeding doesn't somehow sound quite as revolutionary or <laughs> <laughs> alarming. <laughs> so when when people first start to learn about this approach, what are some of the things that they might find surprising about what they might read for example in your book Born to Eat? Are there are there is there anything about this approach that could be considered controversial? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I think um, there are a lot of things that could be considered controversial. And I think it's because people just don't know um, and haven't had experience with this type of feeding in in a long time. Um, so when you tell somebody to give baby like a medium cooked slice of steak or a scrambled egg or a slice of avocado, um, they might look at you like they're crazy, like, oh no, we need to, we need to spoon feed this kid. A and piece of steak for a <laughs> six month old baby? Absolutely. See? <laughs> um, but yeah, so what you do is the, what you cook it kind of medium or a little, on, not too tough. You want them to be able to gum it, mm-hmm. but they have total control of it by cutting it in like a finger slice, looking like a finger so they can hold it and manipulate it. And if we don't, push the spoon into their mouths, they're in charge of that. And a normally developing six month old has the skill to handle solid textures. Um, Whereas when we used to see guidelines that were four to six months, say a four month old was not used to or not able to use or manipulate this type of texture. Whereas a six month old is if they're developmentally appropriate or have developed, you know, normally to that point, um, they can manipulate those hmm. solid foods. So some of the problem may have been that we were introducing solid foods too soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, you write in your book that, um, you know, it's perfectly fine if your baby just takes that little piece of steak and sucks on it. Um, yes. <laughs> that, that that's, that's perfectly acceptable. What if they manage to get a little bit off and swallow it without chewing it? Is that okay? Well, the reason you're, you're doing more of a medium texture one is if they are sucking it, there's, there are studies that suggest that the degree of cooking a steak or not cooking a steak allows for that heme iron to be absorbed. And iron is a really important nutrient for, for infants beginning solid foods. And so they can, if they do manage to gum that enough to get some and swallow it, they're usually okay. That's why we don't want to make it like an overly cooked steak. So keeping that in mind, and we give recommendations on how to cook, how to slice. um, And there are a lot of, a lot of ways that can make parents feel more confident about doing this. Oh, that's Uh, important because I think (laughs) parents are nervous about, about this. You know, it feels like Mm -hmm. that baby's brand new and you have an opportunity Mm -hmm. to do it, you know, perfectly. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. And the, the iron issue is something, you know, there are a lot of, um, health professionals, even dietitians, they're like, but what about the nutrition, the nutrition and the possibility for deficiency? Well, right. That was actually my next question. You know, like if, if the baby is making the decisions about what they're going to eat and what they're not going to eat, then how do we make sure that they are, are actually getting all the nutrients that they need? I mean, with a, with a baby food or baby cereal, it's fortified. So at least we mm-hmm. know it's like a little vitamin pill, you know? It's, <laughs> exactly. Well, they still get to decide whether they're going to eat it. So it's not like, and this is, this is so funny because a lot of people um, have in their mind, like babies standing by the grill, making their steak. <laughs> it's, it's really, I mean, obviously the parent gets to decide what is going to be offered. And we suggest that parents offer one iron rich food, one energy rich food, and one vitamin C rich food or fruit and vegetable. So they just got a little fill in, just think about filling in the blank. So they don't miss any of these key nutrients. And a lot of these nutrients that come from whole foods versus, you know, um, say a a fortified food, the bioavailability of that nutrient is actually better. Can and be there, yeah. there, yeah, can be higher. And there are some studies that are really supporting this. The other controversial issue is choking. Yep. I can't, I can't tell you how many, like you said, like if baby's gnawing on a piece of steak, are they going to choke? Not if it's given to them in a texture that is appropriate for them. Again, not overly cooked, um, it can, and it needs to be manageable for their hands so they can control it completely. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned choking because I think that that is perhaps the other big, uh, 
fear that parents have when they evaluate this approach, or especially maybe the grandparents. But in the book, you you make an important distinction between gagging. And when you described it, I thought like, oh, yes, I've seen babies do that. And I've overreacted. So you you um, draw a distinction between gagging and choking. And you say that that gagging process is actually, that's part of how they're learning how to manage you know, the, the, the process of chewing and swallowing. So mm-hmm. tell us just a little bit more about that, how we can feel comfortable and confident that, you know, that our babies aren't going to choke if we let them do this. Right. And, and I will say the research suggests that choking among all feeding me- methods is, is pretty similar. It's really about certain foods. So certain foods increase the risk of um, choking and position like if babies reclined or if they're coin mm-hmm. shaped. So it's more the food and the delivery um, the shape of that food versus the method of feeding and sometimes actually forcing a food into baby's into baby's mouth increase the risk for choking. Mm. So choking is something that a lot of parents um, may never see, but it's very scary. And we a lot of times confuse gagging with choking. Right. Um, and the gag reflex is where the say baby, let's use that slice of steak again. Say baby does get a piece of steak that's too big. He, he may make a very um, scared face and he'll cough or hack and try, you can tell he's trying to manipulate the food and will likely spit it out. That's a safety mechanism. Mm -hmm. And that means he was, he's, uh, you know, appropriate to um, know whether a texture is going to work for him or not. So I think that's, that's great. But what happens is (laughs) we as parents have to sit there and just watch and not freak out because they can tell if we're freaking out, but we have to watch and, and just um, make sure that they're able to clear it because if we're trusting them and not freaking out, they're more likely to trust themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, if baby is choking, it's very different. You may not hear sounds at all. Um, The airway is blocked by the food. And again, that's more not necessarily related to a feeding method, you know, traditional versus baby led or self feeding, but more certain foods, particularly raw apples. They're the number one culprit, mm-hmm. which is why we say, let's not do a raw apple. we will do a baked or uh, find other ways to, to really incorporate that. And luckily um, my sister is a speech therapist who specializes in feeding. So we really used her, um, her knowledge here in working through gagging and choking and, and all of that. <laughs> That's so funny. I also have a sister, her sister who's a speech therapist and who does a lot of <laughs> swallowing work. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Leslie, in your book, you include some resources to help parents educate grandparents and other caregivers on these principles that might be somewhat unfamiliar for baby led weaning. Is, is this a major challenge for parents who, who are choosing this method of feeding? Um, I don't, I don't think it's a major challenge because a lot of the parents that are deciding to kind of take this route have done some, have done some research on the front end, have done their own studies, um, about how to do this. Um, but you're, for example, in my own life, there was a particular, um, my little girl went to a parent's day out and (laughs) they looked at me like I was crazy. Um, when I said she can self feed, there are no spoon, I'm not sending a spoon. And they really looked like I, I was crazy and they weren't, um, they were not, um, disinterested. They just didn't know that this was appropriate. And it took just a little bit of, this is why we're, this is why we as a family and me as a nutrition professional, this is why we're doing this. And just a little bit of help, um, to understand people really get it and they were open to it. So we do offer, um, some, some letters that can be copied or, you know, cut and paste, however you want to do it from the book to, to give to like healthcare providers or um, say daycare providers, or, and even say you have a grandparent or an aunt or something that helps just explain it a little way and to keep them safe. So what we want to do is you want all the caregivers who are going to be involved in your child's life to really be on the same page so they can be safe. And, and most of all, so they can support, support your child self-regulating. So learning how to trust their own bodies around food and hunger and fullness. Mm. 
Mm. Now, just to be clear, uh, you, you're suggesting that for very small children, a spoon may not be appropriate, but we're not, eventually it becomes appropriate to teach them how to use silverware just a little bit later. Well, actually, you can give them a spoon. Um, Say if I were giving my little girl Greek yogurt, and what I would do is I might load the spoon because she may not be able to load it yet and then let her take it from there. Mm. So spoons definitely have a place, but not in the parent's hands necessarily. Ah, I see. That's an important distinction. Mm -hmm. So, So at the other end of the spectrum of those who may be dubious about baby led weeding, I've heard some some reports about baby led weaning groups and forums, you know, Facebook groups that get can get really intense and dogmatic about what is and isn't the correct way to do this. So I want you to tell us a little bit by what you mean when you say what you chew is up to you. <laughs> this is something that I've jokingly said for, for years. <laughs> um, I think it first came out uh, with one of the um, dietary guidelines. I'm like, okay, this was a post that I did. But I, I love this phrase because everybody has an opinion. Health, health professionals have opinions. Some of them are differing, which explains why so many people are confused. Um, but and there's people are so um, black and white about this method. It's either this way or that way. You're all in or you're not. But really, it's up to your family, um, uh, the parent, to decide what is best for you. So you know, you get to be the the person who decides: Am I going to let them use a spoon? Am I am I going to let the child care provider actually spoon feed her? But tell the child care provider how to watch for signs of hunger and fullness so she Mm -hmm. can maintain her responsiveness. Um, So you get to decide how you feed your child. You're the expert of your home and family. And what we try to do is give parents the information, which is evidence-based, and they get to decide what's right for them. Like, and a So if they decide that part of it's going to be using a spoon, sometimes purees, sometimes solids, that's really what works best for a family. And we sure don't want a mom to feel like they're doing something wrong or a dad to feel like they're doing something wrong because they're really in charge. I always like to say, I choose the cupcake. I'm going to eat a cupcake at the, at a birthday party and it fits within my parameters of health. Um, So what you chew is up to you and, and your family. Yeah. I think, unfortunately we see that black and white, mentality in a lot of areas of nutrition, don't we? Not just uh, children's nutrition and and baby led weaning, but. Absolutely. I mean, health and I think the health and pleasure and learning how to appreciate our bodies and food, it really comes with living in the gray. You can't be on the (laughs) black or white side of that. (laughs) Right. So uh, finally, Leslie, how could adopting this approach and doing baby led weaning affect a child's eating habits or even their attitudes about food later in life? Or or could it even have an impact on other members of the family, like older siblings, maybe? Well, and this is one of, this is, one of the main reasons that we're so happy that Born to Eat came to life is because, you know, I've worked in in my career for about 15 years um, doing counseling and sports nutrition and disordered eating and working with families and pediatrics and realize it all comes full circle. So if you have a parent who has some issues around food, it's possible that they are contagious. And so what what we really wanted to do was take this feeding method that supports self-regulation and attunement from baby's first bite and teach the whole family how to get around that and support it. So it's listening to your internal regulation system. So when am, when am I hungry? When am, when am I satisfied? When have I had enough? And taking the whole family on the journey um, really can help, I think, everyone just become healthier and more mindful in the process, which means you can leave out phrases like just a few more bites or no, you know, no more cookies. So, and parents are still the nutritional gatekeepers. They get to decide what's offered, when's, when it's offered and where it's offered, but the kids get to decide how much I'm going to eat and, and how much. And that's, we really support, you know, all of Ellen Satter's work too in the division of responsibility. And we think that's important for the entire family um, to break away from our dieting culture and use their own nutrition intuition. 
Yeah, I think we don't realize as adults how much we project our own food issues and insecurities onto our children. And, and you know, we're we're laying down the groundwork for their lifetime relationship to food. So this seems like so much healthier a way to um to introduce kids, babies really, to the to the pleasures and the responsibilities, you know, of of uh, eating well and and taking good Absolutely. care of ourselves. Absolutely. Leslie Schilling, thank you so much, both for this wonderful resource that you and Wendy Jo have created for us and for your time today. The book is called Born to Eat, and you can learn more at the book's website, which is borntoeatbook.com. And you can also find Leslie and Wendy Jo on your favorite social media platforms. They're at Born to Eat Book. That's the handle, Born to Eat Book. So you can uh, find them on Facebook and Twitter and all the rest. And of course, we'll have links to all of that in the show notes, which are at nutritiondiva.quickanddirtytips.com. Thanks so much for listening. And thanks again to Leslie for joining us. Thank you. And we wish you all the best with your book. Thank you so much. And now for all of you listening, have a great week and remember to eat something good for me.